Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen. A few days ago, within this building, the forum entitled The Summit of the Future took place. Russia showed understanding to the Secretary General's idea to convene that summit since the crisis of our organization is growing worse and something needs to be done about that. And we were involved honestly in the preparations for the summit, although quite frankly, we didn't have any particular illusions about it. In the contemporary history of the UN, there have been many ambitious events that concluded with uh, loud declarations that were quickly forgotten about. For example, in 2000, the Millennium Summit declared the task of freeing peoples from the scourge of war. Just two years after that, the USA, at the head of the Coalition of the Willing, under the laughable pretext, without a mandate from the UN Security Council, invaded Iraq, a country which has still not been able to recover from the destructive consequences of that escapade. In 2005, the UN World Summit declared a commitment to establishing a just peace in accordance with the principles and purposes of the UN Charter. This sacred obligation certainly didn't stop the USA and their allies from getting the then leader of Georgia, Mikhail Saakashvili, in 2008 to unleash an armed aggression against the people of South Ossetia and Russian peacekeepers. And a further three years after that, NATO organized the military intervention in Libya, destroying its statehood and undermining the stability of neighboring countries. In 2015, the UN Summit on Sustainable Development adopted grandiose plans to combat poverty and inequality. But they turned out to be empty promises in light of the reluctance of the countries of the West to refrain from their new colonial practices of um, mining the wealth of the entire world for their benefit. Just look at the statistics of the promises that were kept in terms of financing the development of the countries of the global south and the transfer of environmentally friendly technologies. Just like Kofi Annan and Ban Ki-moon in the past, the current Secretary General advanced his own initiative under the slogan of rebooting global cooperation. It's an excellent slogan. Who could be opposed to that? But what global cooperation can we really talk about at a time when the West has trampled all of these unshakable values of globalization that they've been telling us about for so many years from this rostrum, trying to convince us that they would ensure equal access for everyone to the goods of contemporary civilization? Where is the inviability of property, the presumption of innocence, freedom of speech, access to information, fair competition on markets with understandable and unchanging rules. The Secretary General is talking about global cooperation at the same time as the countries of the West have unleashed a veritable sanctions war against a good half, if not the majority, of states in the world. And the dollar, which was advertised to us as the heritage and good of all of humanity, has been grossly transformed into a weapon. For more than 60 years, there has been a trade blockade of Cuba, the cancellation of which the overwhelming majority of members of the international community are calling for in the pursuit of the ever more uh, ephemeral aim of preserving their domination. Washington is blocking the normal work of the World Trade Organization on dispute settlement and reform of the Bretton Woods institutions, the structures of which for a long time now have not reflected the real balance of forces in the global economy and finances. The West also wants to transform the UN into a tool for advancing its mercantile plans. As was shown by the Summit of the Future, there are more and more attempts to erode the intergovernmental nature of the organization. Uh, long necessary changes in the staffing of the Secretariat are being held back. Key posts in the Secretariat are now essentially occupied and handed down to representatives of the Western minority. If the Secretary General is calling for a reboot of global cooperation, then the Secretariat must advance unifying ideas and propose compromise options rather than coming up with excuses to introduce into the UN's work narratives that are beneficial to the West. Breathing new life into the UN, it's not too late to do that. But in order to do that, we can't have unrealistic summits and declarations. Rather, it must be done through rebuilding confidence and trust on the basis of the charter principle of the sovereign equality of all member states. However, as long uh, as confidence is being undermined, for the time being it is, and the actions of the West to create in circumvention of the UN uh, 
narrow formats that are subordinate to it to resolve subsidiary uh, uh, fateful issues such as internet governance and artificial intelligence. But those problems affect all the future of all of humanity, and they must be considered on a universal basis without discrimination uh, or trying to achieve unilateral advantage. That is to say that there must be an honest negotiation involving all members of the UN rather than the way that the so-called Pact of the Future was prepared for without a single plenary round of negotiations that all countries would be involved in. But instead of that, the work was carried out under the control of Western manipulators. As a result, the pact, even before it was born, had already joined the pantheon of declarations that sound nice in English. Uh, sad as it is, that is the fate of products of these world summits. However, things aren't any better when it comes to implementing Security Council resolutions, which are binding. The sabotage of decisions on the Kosovo settlement and the Dayton agreements on Bosnia and Herzegovina says a great deal. But the most glaring example continues to be spinning out over almost 80 years the consensus resolutions on the creation of an independent Palestinian state coexisting in peace and security with Israel. There can be no justification to, for acts of terrorism, which Israelis fell victim to on the 7th of October last year. But everyone who still has a sense of compassion is outraged by the fact that the October tragedy is being used for the mass collective punishment of the Palestinians uh, in the form of an unprecedented humanitarian catastrophe. The killing of Palestinian civilians with American weapons must immediately be ended. It is important to ensure the delivery of humanitarian aid to the enclave, the reconstruction of infrastructure, and most importantly, it is important to guarantee the realization of the legitimate right of the Palestinians to self-determination and to allow them, not in words, but in deeds, as they say, on the ground, to create a contiguous and viable state within the 1967 borders with its capital in East Jerusalem. Another glaring example of terrorist methods as a means of achieving political aims is the inhumane attack on Lebanon that transformed civilian technology into a lethal weapon. There must be an immediate investigation into this crime, but already we cannot remain silent in the face of the many publications in the media, including in Europe and here in the United States, that indicate to varying degrees the involvement and at the very least awareness of Washington when it comes to the preparation of that uh, terrorist attack. And we understand that the Americans always deny everything, and they do everything they can to uh, hush up any facts that come to light, as they did in response to the irrefutable evidence of their implication in the terrorist attack on the Nord Stream gas pipeline. Those gas pipelines, incidentally, were a marvelous symbol of that self-same global cooperation that our Secretary General dreams of. But as a result of their destruction, the competitiveness of the European Union in the global economy has been undermined for long years to the benefit of the United States. It is on the West's conscience as well that the truth about those who organized many other heinous crimes has been um, put on a back burner, including the bloody provocation in the Kiev sub of, of Bucha in, and the series of poisonings of citizens of Russia in Britain and Germany. The UN Secretariat cannot remain uh, separate from efforts to establish the truth in situations that directly impact impact global security and in doing so is obliged to strictly observe Article 100 of the UN Charter to act impartially and to avoid the temptation to play into the hands of individual states, particularly those that are actively calling not for cooperation but to divide the world into the flowering garden and the jungle or to those sitting uh, around the table of democracy and those that are on the menu. We mustn't forget also about the service record of those that demand that their rules be implemented by the rest of the world. The inv invasion of Afghanistan and the inglorious 20-year presence there of the infamous coalition was accompanied by the formation of al-Qaeda. A direct result of the aggression against Iraq was the creation of ISIL. 
unleashing the war in Syria gave rise to Jabhat al-Nusra, which is now Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, and the destruction of Libya opened the floodgates for the uh, permeation of terrorism into the Sahara Sahel region and for the flow of millions of illegal migrants to Europe. We call upon all of those that are thinking about the future of their peoples and countries to be very wary of any new uh, escapades by those who invented these rules. We are particularly concerned by the now almost commonplace practice of political killings as once again took place yesterday in Beirut. The tragic and unacceptable turn of events in the Arab-Israeli conflict in Yemen, in the Red Sea Basin, in the Gulf of Aden, Sudan and other hotspots in Africa reflects an indisputable fact. Security can either be equal and indivisible for all or it won't be for anyone. An understanding of what would seem to be a simple truth in the context of European security is something that Russia for years has been trying to impart to Washington, London and Brussels, who are obsessed with their complexes of their own exceptionalism and impunity, although they initially promised not to expand NATO, and in 1999 and in 2010 they signed in official documents of OSCE summits uh, an obligation to not ensure their security at the expense of others. In fact, the North Atlantic Alliance for three decades has been carrying out the geopolitical and military expansion of NATO into Europe. It is trying to take root in the South Caucasus and Central Asia, creating direct threats to the security of our country. And now the same is happening in the Asia-Pacific region, where NATO infrastructure is creeping in and uh, to contain or deter China and Russia. Narrow military political blocks are being created that undermine the inclusive security architecture under the ASEAN umbrella. And the West is not only not remembering about the global cooperation that our Secretary General is such a fan of, but openly in their doctrine documents, they are harshly accusing Russia, China, Belarus, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea and Iran of creating threats to their domination. In respect of Russia, they have declared the aim of dealing it a strategic defeat almost just like London and Washington planned in May 1945 with the development, even before the end of the Second World War, of operation, an operation entitled Operation Unthinkable to destroy the USSR. Back then, this was kept top secret, but the current Anglo-Saxon strategists are not hiding their ideas. Uh, for now, they do, it's true, uh, hope to defeat Russia using the illegitimate neo-Nazi Kiev regime, but they're already preparing Europe for it to also throw itself into this suicidal escapade. I'm not going to talk here about the senselessness and the danger of the very idea of trying to fight to victory with a nuclear power, which is what Russia is. Equally senseless are... Western, the Western backers of Kiev swearing that there is no alternative to negotiations based on the infamous peace formula. They are defending this doomed ultimatum by um, shamelessly invoking the UN Charter, demanding the territorial integrity of Ukraine be ensured. And I would like to recall, in particular, I'd like to remind the colleagues in the Secretariat that the Charter isn't just about territorial integrity. Charter 1 of the Charter declares the obligation to respect the principles of the equality and self-determination of peoples, and that served as the international legal basis for the process of decolonization, which incidentally still needs to be completed, however much the French, the British, and uh, other former colonial countries may resist. In 1970, the General Assembly unanimously established, decided in its declaration that everyone must observe the territorial integrity of those states whose governments respect the rights of peoples to self-determination and on that basis provide the entire population um, living on that territory. And I underscore that this was a unanimous decision of the UN General Assembly following long years of difficult discussions. There's no need to prove that Ukrainian neo-Nazis, having seized power in Kiev as a result of the US and allies-supported bloody coup d'etat in February 2014, didn't 
and are not still uh, representing the Russian population of Crimea, Donbas, and Novorossiya. The Western leaders, doing anything they can to talk about human rights, uh, are in a very telling way staying silent about these rights when it comes to the racist actions of their cl clients in Kiev. In the light of this forgetfulness, I'll remind you about another requirement, again, in Article 1 of the UN Charter, the requirement to respect the rights and fundamental freedoms of any person regardless of race, sex, language, and religion. The rights of Russians and those that feel that they are part of Russian culture following the coup d'etat in Kiev have methodically been exterminated. The Russian language in Ukraine is banned by law in all areas, in education, the media, art, culture, and even in day-to-day -day life. Recently, another law was adopted banning the canonical Ukrainian Orthodox Church. These, gross, these are gross violations of the rights of Russians enshrined in the UN Charter, and they bring with them threats uh, to the security of Russia and all of Europe, stemming from the Kiev regime and those that are dragging it into NATO. And all of these are the root causes of the current Ukrainian crisis. It is to uh, address these that is the aim of the special military operation that Russia is carrying out to defend its security and the current, present and future of the people on their native lands. We value the sincere aim of a number of our partners to advance um, out of the best interests uh, mediation initiatives. We value their constructive results focus, unlike the uh, hopeless Zelensky peace formula. We call upon our friends in their further efforts to take into account in full the facts that I have mentioned about the real reasons of this situation, the real causes of this situation, unless they are addressed uh, um, a just UN Charter-based peace will not be possible. A realistic settlement plan was outlined by President Putin on the 14th of June, when once again, uh, convincingly, he demonstrated Russia's goodwill when it comes to achieving negotiated agreements, the prospects for which were thrown out by Kiev and its backers as a result of the coup d'etat in 2014, the uh, disruption of the Minsk agreements in 2015, and the Istanbul agreements of uh, 2022. The unprecedented level of arrogance and aggressiveness of Western politicians against Russia simply uh, not only nullifies the Secretary General's idea of global cooperation, but it is increasingly also blocking the functioning of the entire system of global governance, including the Security Council. That's not something we chose, and, and we're not responsible for the consequences of this dangerous course. However, if the West doesn't stop, there will be serious costs that will be felt by everyone. The glo it is clear to the global majority that confrontation and hegemony will not resolve any global problem. They will only artificially hold back the objective process of the formation of a multipolar world order that will be based on the equal rights of large and small nations, that will respect the values of human uh, identity, the equality of men and women, and the rights of peoples to determine their own fate. And incidentally, all of these are also quotes from the UN Charter, just like the principle of non-interference in the internal affairs of sovereign states as well. A, a, a confirmation of which, uh, to the shame of the members of our organization, was blocked by the U.S. and their satellites at that very same summit of the future when the pact was adopted. Speaking on the 18th of September before the participants in the Fourth Eurasian Women's Forum in St. Petersburg, President Putin underscored the need for a pooling of efforts in the name of sustainable development and general universal, equal, and indivisible security. Addressing the most complex problems facing all of humanity is something we can only do together, taking into account one another's interests. The West must realize this and refrain from its new colonial ideas. The Global South and the East are more loudly speaking about their rights and their fully-fledged participation in decision-making processes on the whole range of the international agenda, which is becoming particularly relevant in a situation in which the West is steadily destroying the model of globalization that they themselves created. The role of interstate associations in Asia, Africa, and Latin America is growing stronger, including the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the African Union, the Community of Latin American and Caribbean Countries, the League of Arab States, the Eurasian Economic Union, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, and others. 
the contacts between those regional integration structures are being established among themselves and also with the global association, the BRICS, which is creating opportunities for harmonizing approaches and agreeing on mechanisms for mutually beneficial cooperation and development that are not under the control of, the, of any negative external influence or diktats. All of these objective processes need to be taken into account in the work of the G20 as well, where the G7 is no longer able to pick the tune. We need to take a new look at ways of ensuring security in various regions, learning lessons from the sad experience of the functioning of the NATO-centric models or the models, the so-called model of Euro-Atlantic security that the West has used to serve their own expansionist ideas. Russia advanced the initiative of forming an inclusive architecture of equal and indivisible security in Eurasia, which, and I wish to underscore this, is open for all states and organizations on our shared continent. We stand ready to work together to find mutually acceptable solutions, the use of interlinkages and the natural competitive advantages of a single Eurasian space. This subject, uh, this will be the subject of an international conference in Minsk that begins on the 31st of October this year. We are not stepping away from dialogue with the West. In July, upon the proposal of Russia, there was an open debate in the Security Council on the subject of building a more just, more sustainable world order. We believe it is important to begin the discussion that, we, that has begun in the UN as well as in other uh, platforms with a fairer world order undoubtedly requires the expansion of the representation of the Global South in the UN Security Council. We support our position in favor of the candidacies of Brazil and India will, while at the same time taking a positive decision on the well-known initiatives of the African Union. However, of course, we cannot even talk about any additional seats for Western countries who are already excessively overrepresented within the Security Council. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, May next year, we will mark the 80th anniversary of the victory in the Second World War, during which the genocidal policy of the Third Reich killed tens of millions of people, including 27 million citizens of all of the peoples of the Soviet Union. These crimes do not have a statute of limita limitations, nor is any moral justification for those who are trying to whitewash Nazi executioners, collaborators, and their current adherents, be it in Ukraine, the Baltics, Canada, or in any other countries. Today, the world is facing extremely serious challenges that require a joining of forces rather than confrontation and a thirst for global domination. Russia will always stand on the side of collective work, on the side of truth and law, peace and cooperation in the interests of giving rebirth to those ideals that were enshrined by the Founding Fathers. That is the aim of the Group of Friends in Defense of the UN Charter that was uh, created upon the initiative of Venezuela. Its purposes and principles remain fully relevant. The most important thing is to make sure that absolutely everyone is guided by those principles, not selectively choosing from a menu, but rather in their entirety and as they are interlinked, including the principle of the sovereign equality of states. Then, working in favor of forming an honest balance of legitimate national interests, the legitimate national interests of all countries, we will be able to give life to the purpose of the UN that is enshrined in the Charter, to be a center for, the harmonizing, for harmonizing the actions of nations. Thank you. I thank the Minister for Foreign Affairs of the Russian Federation. I now give the floor to Her Excellency Alicia Barcena Ibarra, Minister for Foreign Affairs of Mexico. <laughs> 